Discover Drones is your go-to resource for learning about drones, drones in business, emerging drone technology, and drones in STEM education. I am Dr. Heather Monthy, an FAA-certificated flight instructor, commercial pilot, remote pilot, and dedicated STEM educator. Join us as we discover more about drone safety, urban air mobility, business, and education. Let's get started. Have you been thinking about buying a new drone to use in your small business? Or maybe you've been interested in getting started flying drones as a business. If you're in the United States and are interested in flying drones commercially, you'll need to pass the Part 107 Remote Pilot Exam. I've prepared a free FAA Part 107 study guide to help you learn what you need to study to pass the FAA Part 107 exam. Head over to flyelectricmonarch.com slash FAA Part 107 Test Prep to pick up your free download today. The link is also in the show notes of today's episode. All right, so let's dive in. So this is a research article that was published in 2018, and it was written by Kuzma, Robinson, Dobson, and Law. And um, I'm really just, I'm excited about this one because there was some really just, like, I mean, practical is in the title of the article, but there was some really just very practical things that I think anybody at any level of doing any sort of drone education program, whether it's in K-12, higher ed, as their business, um, law enforcement, you know, first responders, that kind of stuff. These are all really good things to take into consideration when developing a drone education program. And they also cited a couple of different other really good articles as well that I will link to in the show in the show notes. I'll give you guys all the sources so you can go and look at these articles uh, if you'd like as well. So I did find these off Google Scholar. These are not articles that uh, just come right up in Google. But um, if you're familiar with Google Scholar, you can find these in there. But again, I'll put the links there for you so you can find the articles. So um, one of the first uh, points that was brought up is that, and I think that we all know this, if you're listening to this podcast, you know this, but that the use of drones has expanded outside of the military uh, a lot over the last you know, 15 years or so. It's expanded out of the military into business applications, and then it's being used in multiple industries within business. And one thing that I have seen over the last five years, and it is March of 2020 right now, one of the things I've seen over the last five years is that the drone technology has become so much more affordable that now we're seeing the shift into bringing drones into the classrooms. And so as we, as that technology becomes more and more affordable, you find different um, industries, different business use cases for it. Um, and now you also see it getting into you know, education and in the classroom. Um, and uh, so there was a, an article written in 2015 by the European Commission. And what they did is they performed an impact report and found that by 2025, drones will account for 10% of all air traffic. Again, I just, you know, I kind of take these kind of reports, and I talked about this in the last episode as well, I kind of take these kind of reports with a grain of salt, because they're just trying to predict where they see things going. Things are good. Sometimes they're correct, sometimes they're not. You know, I did my PhD, I did my dissertation on green technology and uh, IT managers, you know, decision making process of that. And, you know, there were some astronomical, you know, numbers in there that by, you know, 2018 or something, it was supposed to be a $5 billion industry. You know, so things pan out, things don't pan out. So kind of take those things with a grain of salt. Um, and then also in uh, in this article, it was also stated that the number of drone jobs in the U.S. is, is set to exceed 100,000 by 2025. I don't really know what kind of drone jobs that they uh, researched because, you know, there's there's a lot of different drone types of uh, jobs that are probably currently don't exist just yet. So it'd be interesting to see, you know, how this field looks in 2025 and what kind of jobs have been created over the next five years. So, I think that as we talk about a pedagogical approach to drones in the classroom, this really applies to any sort of technology and how we bring it into the classroom. So as a technology, a specific technology advances, the approach or the pedagogical approach or andrological approach, if you're talking about adults, needs to 
shift and that we need to include more technology-based competencies within that curriculum. So, you know, you know, I, 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 talk about this quite a bit. And if you've talked to me in person, I, you know, I bring it up quite a bit is that when you're putting together a technology based curriculum, you're not necessarily saying, you know, uh, students need to know this software. Students need to know how to use this operating system. Students need to know how to use this piece of technology. That's not necessarily what we're talking about here. It's more the, uh, skills that are needed to be able to use that specific piece of technology. And the same goes for drones. We're not saying, you know, students will learn how to use drones. It's it's what are the skills that come along and, and the competencies that come along with being able to use drones, understanding airspace, using good aeronautical decision making, things like that. And there is another article that uh, actually it's a book that um, I actually just read. There are a couple things that are out of date in this book, but it's still a really good book. It's by Carnahan, uh, 2016, Carnahan et al. And uh, they state in that book that the inclusion of drones in the curriculum uh, does improve student motivation and engagement. And I think that, you know, that's going to be true when you have any sort of hands-on practical, concrete ways that students can see their work being done. So it doesn't matter if you're five years old or 50 years old, when you can see what you're doing and see how the things that you do and change can affect the output, right? So thinking about something like drone programming, for example, teaching programming is very difficult because it's very abstract. You You can't necessarily sort of visualize or see what's happening behind the scenes or see what's really going on. Drones make that much more concrete for people of all ages. So when you are, you know, programming a a drone to do a specific task and then you execute it and it does that task and then you can make small tweaks to your code and then you can see those small tweaks when the drone is flying, you know, that becomes much more motivating and much more engaging for students of all levels to really just, you know, stay engaged, be excited about what they're doing. And it allows us to give students those concrete examples of how some of the different STEM principles are applied. So one other thing that was brought up in this article was that, and we've talked about this a lot in this podcast, and if you listen to this podcast when it was still called About the T in STEM, I talked a lot about soft skills, professional skills, that kind of thing that's needed. It's not just the technical skills that are needed to use some of these different technologies, drones included. So things like soft skills or what I like to call professional skills, these are very valuable skills to employers. And so these are going to be things like teamwork, problem solving, presentation skills, project management skills, all those kinds of things are going to be used when you bring drones into the classroom. And and as much as you can do to bring those skills out in anybody that you're teaching how to use drones, you know, if you're teaching, you know, 25 year olds on, you know, how to start a drone based business, it's not just the skills of flying the drones. There's all these other things that come alongside that. So in this book, um, Carnahan et al., uh, the book is called Drones in Education. Um, what they did is they talked about a little bit about the SOAR model for use of drones in the classroom. And I'll do a separate podcast episode just about that book. Um, but because it was cited in this uh, practical pedagogy research article, I wanted to bring it up um, because that's what this uh, article is based off of is this SOAR model, S-O-A-R. So it focuses really heavily on the student's experience, but it uses research-based education in ethics, uh, legal, and pragmatic uses of drone technology. So the SOAR model is this. S is for safety and legal issues. O is for operations, flight management, and troubleshooting. A is for active learning, engagement, and solving problems. And then R is for research and practical applications. So uh, the the authors of this article state that this model has been used successfully in K-12 applications of drones, um, which the, the book by Carnahan et al., um, 2016, 
was written specifically for K-12 applications of drones. This research article then that I'm talking about is more at the higher ed level. So business computing, that kind of stuff and, and using drones in like sort of a higher ed ed, uh, setting or research-based setting. So what they suggest is that this SOAR model has been successful in K-12 application. So it could also be successful in other types of drone education and training. So say you are training um, current drone pilots on, you know, aerial mapping and surveying. These, this model could be used in that situation as well. So what they did is um, they aligned all their different activities to one of the four um, components of the SOAR model. So safety, operations, active learning, or research. Each each task or each uh, uh, objective was aligned to one of those. And so what they did um, at the very beginning with, as they were looking at, like, how can we bring a drone education program here, there was a couple things that they had to do. So the first thing was, is they, uh, the insurance company, they, they worked very closely with their insurance company and, you know, the insurance company is going to be concerned with risk and risk management. So what they did is they required a site risk management. They, um, needed to know what specific drones would be flown. They created safety plans. They did a site survey they did a risk rating matrix, and then um, they did uh, they did all this for all these different site specific locations. So there's going to be indoor and outdoor locations where those drone flights might occur. So they did this assessment for every single one of those places where uh, the drone flights might occur on their campus. So if you're in a school that's kind of large. Um, you know, and you guys are thinking about bringing a drone education program in there, you might want to sit down and go, okay, where are some uh, potential uses or potential places that we might um, bring a drone program in? So is it going to be in the gymnasium? Is it going to be in a large classroom? Is it going to be in the cafeteria? Is it going to be outdoors? Is it going to be in the playground? Is it going to be in the football field? Like, where is it going to be? All right. So what you would want to do then is you would want to do a preliminary assessment on each one of those spots to sort of figure out what is going to be the best spot um, for you to do this. So what they said is that they used the, uh, they used the gym and they used some larger classrooms that didn't have any expensive audiovisual equipment. Um, I I don't know about you, but I still crash my drone quite a bit. So uh, that's probably a good thing. And they did, um, uh, eliminate some outdoor sites. But again, you have to do that preliminary assessment to figure out, are are we going to use it? Are we going to rule it out? And if you do rule it out, document it, right? So that you're not asking yourself the same question six months from now. So this, uh, this study or this article was written in the UK. So they're using CAA laws there. And there's some laws there around, uh, being around high voltage cables. And I'm not too familiar with the CAA laws. I'm in the U S so I'm very familiar with the FAA laws. Um, but they ruled out some places uh, due to high voltage cables um, nearby their uh, near their school. And then they also decided to help with risk management that it was necessary that they were going to have a certificated pilot on grounds for any type of event that they were doing around drones. So whether it's a seminar, research activity, workshop, whatever it might be. And then it was also decided that they needed to train some of their more staff um, to become certificated drone pilots. The next piece I wanted to talk a little bit about is sort of, you know, what they're going to be doing. What are the outcomes? Okay. So uh, there's another article that was cited in this article by uh, Idris et al. in 2015. I will link to that in the show notes as well. But they talk about, you know, that there are both technical and non-technical needs in drone operations. So when you are putting together a drone education program, you know, think about who, first of all, who are your clients? Are they, are they teachers? Are they uh, real estate brokers? Are they, you know, are they, do they work in the utilities? You know, figure out um, what are the uh, more non-technical needs with regards to that industry. So that's going to, I'm talking more here about like the business processes that they need to follow, but then also understanding 
project management and how to take, you know, a client from idea to implementation and execution, right? And so what you need to do is you need to help them if you know, whoever whoever you're working with and if it's you that you're trying to figure this out you first need to address the business application point of view is how is this going to be applied in business so how are you actually going to use this is this just seem like a really cool idea or what is it that we're trying to accomplish with drones you also want to look at some more non-technical things such as project management risk management, the operations, scheduling, that kind of thing. Um, but then you also want to make sure that you are including the practical hands-on flying experience. So I know here in the U.S., you know, to become a certificated uh, commercial remote pilot, uh, it's simply a 60-question written uh, multiple-choice exam. We don't need to demonstrate any sort of hands-on practical flying experience. Um, so I think that it's important as you are, you know, trying to build a drone education program is that you give that hands-on practical flying experience. So the outcomes, I'm just going to read um, for you what the outcomes were for this particular research study. This is what they had decided were going to be the outcomes of their drone education program, and it's all aligned to the SOAR model. Okay, so each one of these aligns to one or more of the outcomes in the SOAR model. So the first is to um, have knowledge or under display knowledge of the legal framework in which drones operate. So that's going to be different depending on where you are. Even within the U.S., there are local ordinances, state and local ordinances that you need to be aware of. So that is uh, probably more of a non-technical uh, piece uh, to what you need to know uh, when you are operating drones in an education program. The next is to complete a risk assessment and complete site surveys to industry standards. So depending on what industry you are in, those industry standards are going to be different. So again, if you're in utilities, your industry standards are going to be very different from someone who is doing an after-school um, program at a at a local you know elementary school. Okay, so those those standards are going to be very different. And uh, the third outcome is to demonstrate confidence in operating a drone safely. Um, you know, did, did, how, how you demonstrate confidence, you know, I don't know. I don't know exactly how you, how you, how you measure that. But when, what I would look for here is um, making the right decisions and taking control of making decisions and not letting, not waiting for someone else to make a decision. If you are the remote pilot in command, that you are operating in confidence, you have control over the situation, and you take charge when decisions need to be made. Number four is to successfully implement a practical project using drone technology. So again, you know, depending on what, what uh, industry you're working in, help your students, help your clients implement a practical project that they can use, that they can walk away with, and say, okay, hey, here's how we're going to do this. You know, solve a business problem. Find a business problem for um, for your students to solve. It's it, rather than just here. I'm going to teach you how to fly a drone. It's what problem are you solving with this drone, and then successfully implement a project. So take it from idea to implementation and execution. And then number five is to discuss the potential future applications for drone technology. And I think this is really uh, a great way to stimulate creativity, innovation, um, and coming up with new ideas. Once I think you get exposed to any sort of technology, doesn't matter what it is, that that can really help people sort of see the world from a different lens, I guess. So say you are, just take myself for an example. I've been, a, I've been involved in aviation my whole life. Um, I've been a pilot since 97. I've worked in education since 03 and uh, STEM education specifically. And I have been, 
waiting sort of for this moment to happen where this drone technology becomes much more affordable to get it in front of more and more people, right? And But I could see that years and years and years ago, the technology wasn't there yet. And so because I was able to take sort of my unique background knowledge, I was able to see what might be some potential future uses for drones in education, right? So you take your own experience, take your own background. And then as you start learning more and more and more about a new technology, think about the different ways in your life or in your business or in your classroom, how you might be able to apply this to help solve a problem. And so each one of those five outcomes are aligned to the one of the components in the SOAR model. So in the next part of this research article, what they did was they gave some examples of uh, projects that they that you could do to sort of extend uh, extend the learning for your students. So again, this is just going to depend on what type of drone education program you are running, but these are just some really good ideas. So uh, they gave six different ideas, so I'll just go through them here really quickly. So the first was to construct a 3D model of a building using aerial footage. Um, the next was to construct an annotated panorama that can be used on social media or developing a video presentation for a real estate agent. Uh, the third one would be to capture high quality video footage to use in a film drama. Uh, number four would be to explore the potential for drone delivery of small packages Number five would be to use drone photography and panorama stitching to create an isometric map of a large area. And then number six would be to use use drones as an educational tool for primary students to... um, uh, and so say you're, say you're at a university, you're, you're going to, your pre-service teacher, you could use drones then as an educational tool, you know, as you are uh, making that transition to becoming a, an in-service teacher. And then finally, the authors give a couple different lessons learned, which I think are very important for anyone who is considering bringing drones into the classroom or doing any sort of drone education program. Um, Flying too many drones at one time can be problematic with too many uh, radio frequencies all in the same small space. I know that um, there's a couple like not non-drones, but like robotic based education programs that if you have more than two or three in a room, like they don't work very well. So you want to make sure that whatever drone you do choose to use for your program, that, you know, if you've got 20 people flying in a small area, you want to make sure that the the radio frequencies aren't interfering with each other. Uh, Flying in a gym. um, So there's pros and cons to flying in a gym. So if you're flying in a gym, you know, that you're, you, you don't fall necessarily under the FAA's airspace rules or whatever, you know, uh, aviation authorities in your country. Um, but that it just is going to, it's going to limit the number of drones that can be flown at one time just due to space. Um, but so you've got two things, you've got the too many frequencies and then just due to space that you may not be able to have as many drones flying at the same time that you would like to have. So what they did is in this particular, uh, research article, what they did is they limited it to 20 students, Uh, They agreed that that was a good number due to those two constraints. They also suggested having a trained and certificated pilot with an assistant present for each flying session to help meet those safety requirements. So again, that goes back to risk management and planning. Um, But they had just they had uh, suggested that having a certificated pilot, remote pilot, and and an assistant present for each flying session will help um, will help meet those safety requirements. They also uh, suggested that you schedule times according to daylight hours if you're going to be doing flights outdoors. I know as you get into more of the northern latitudes, again, this was in the UK, so you get more into the northern latitudes that uh, in the winter times, you know, daylight daylight hours can be um, can be an issue, and especially if you're in the southern hemisphere as well, in certain times of year, the farther south you are. Um, that, you know, those daylight hours are going to be limited. So make sure you're paying attention to that. If you're doing activities outdoors when you are scheduling things, pay attention to when uh, your daylight hours are. One other thing that they had suggested was that uh, because weather can be problematic in the UK, what they did is they booked both an outdoor and an indoor location, but then that created some 
sort of double booking scheduling problems um, in their system. It looked like things were being double booked, but really it was more just, you know, if the weather was bad, for, uh, they wouldn't conduct the activity outdoors. They would just move it indoors. And uh, one other uh, suggestion that they had for educators was that each lesson is going to be different in structure. So understand that you are going to have certain times where, you know, if you've got a three hour chunk of time that you're working with students that two hours of it is going to need to be lecture or an hour of it's going to need to be lecture before doing more of the hands-on. And then other times, if you have a three hour chunk, the whole time is going to be all hands-on. So flying anything. So flying an airplane, flying a drone. It, 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 it's not all just flying skill. There's a lot of things that need to be learned on the ground. And so you need to understand that um, not every class lesson is going to include actual uh, hands-on flying time. And one thing that, you know, that they mentioned in here, but I also talk about a lot that I think is really cool is that this is a technology that's going to cross multiple disciplines. So it's important to remember that when developing your education program. So again, what are the outcomes of your program? So if you're a science teacher and you're trying to teach about physics and forces of flight and lift weight, thrust and drag, your lessons are going to look very different for somebody who is trying to start a drone business, right? So, but you have, and you have to understand that because this technology goes across multiple disciplines, you need to keep that in mind when you are developing your education program. And then the final thing that they suggest, and those of us that have worked in education for any length of time, and even this can, this will happen in business as well, is that getting financial buy-in can oftentimes be a challenge. There's a cost to the drones, there's batteries, propellers, uh, netting, then you have the cost for training your your staff, your team um, to become certificated pilots. There's cost for insurance. Um, so getting that financial buying can be a difficult challenge. And so what you want to do there is make sure that you're being very clear, very transparent. This is what it's going to cost, but here's what the benefits are going to be for us. And here's how this is going to help us as a school, an education program, uh, or a business. Um, being very clear with what that uh, financial investment is going to do for your organization. So this was a really great article. And I, like I said, it, it linked, it cited quite a few other research articles that I will be sharing with you guys as well. Um, I, again, I will put the links to all the different articles that re were reviewed here in the show notes. So I suggest that you go check these articles out yourself. Um, there's a lot of really great information in here. And uh, I'm glad I was able to share just a little piece of it with you. So if you like this episode, please share it with somebody that you think might be interested in this. And um, you know, it helps to spread the news about the podcast. I also have a YouTube channel where um, I have the uh, the podcast placed on the YouTube channel with captions. So people who need the closed captions can still participate in, in the podcast. And then I've also got different tutorials and um, some other things uh, on my YouTube channel around drones and learning with drones. So I invite you to uh, subscribe to my YouTube channel. That will also be posted in the show notes. If you are driving and you, you don't want to... Uh, you, you, you're not going to be able to look right now, but yeah, my YouTube channel is just Heather Monthy, PhD, CFI, and I hope to see you guys there, and I will see you guys in the next episode.